Well, good morning, everyone. It's uh, very pleasant to, to be back here and to see so many of you this morning. So my name is Virginia Robert, and I'm the Foreign Desk Editor for Les Echo. It's the French uh, Business Daily. Uh, we're gathered, gathered here this morning to talk about um, how to boost economic progress by investing into the sustainable development goals that were set by the UN in 2015 and that are meant to be reached by 2030. I must tell you, I was at the Paris Peace Forum last weekend. Maybe some of you heard of it or saw it on television. Um, and it was really, really striking to see the pessimism of some political leaders uh, regarding uh, the ge geopolitical environment and, and the prospects of uh, multilateralism. But uh, Antonio Guterres was there. He was a little pessimistic, but at the same time, he kept faith. And he is the one to pinpoint the progress made in the last years towards fighting hunger, children mortality, or extreme poverty. And he wants to do more with the help of states, of ONGs, and big institutions like his. Yet, two reports were published last week uh, that show that funding is insufficient. The first one was from the OECD, uh, showing that uh, investment in developing countries had receded by 30% in 2016, 2017, and that if the aid from rich countries is stable, it's under the objectives that were set. And then there was a second report, this time from the European Union, and the observations are exactly the same. The funds promised to help developing countries by 2013 represent only 0.5% of Europe's wealth when it should be 07 And that means that there's a 140 billion gap to be, uh, to, to be overcome. And at best, only 115 billion are earmarked for now. So there's a lot to be done. But there's a lot of progress too on the ground. A lot of practical solutions that exist and we're going to talk about those. Uh, one of the problems um, we're going to talk about, first of all, let me introduce the panelists. That would be much better. Let's start with Gary. Uh, Gary White is the CEO of uh, Water.org. He's going to talk to us about it. And maybe you know his organization because uh, one of the co-founders is, is Matt Damon. We don't have Matt, but we have Gary. Uh, <laughs> Mary Robinson is the former president of Ireland. She's been very much involved into climate change issues, and now she's president of the Elders, which is an ONG that was set up by uh, Nelson Mandela. Next to me is Sue Desmond Hellman. She's the CEO of the Gates Foundation, and she was a former Genentech executive. And finally, Sir Phil Timuri, and she's the CEO of Vodafone, the telco and service company. So thanks to all of you to be, uh, to be with us this morning. Uh, my first question probably is, is about scale. It seems that there are two ways to improve scale. It's technology and it's investment. So maybe we're going to start with technology and you, Gary. Um, actually, it's not so much technology because you're more into financing and you're more into loan. But mm -hmm. can you tell us what you did with water.org? Yeah, yeah, I think it's, it's as much innovation as it is technology. Right, right. Those two go hand in hand. But, uh, you know, I think that what, what we see with water.org and, and water equity, which is our social impact fund manager that spun off from water.org, what we see is the, the immense problem with this, but also the, the hope that's, that's inside of the problem. And, you know, right now, nearly a billion people don't have access to water around the world, and more than two billion don't have access to improved sanitation. And what that means is that women today will spend about 200 million hours walking to find water and to collect it and bring it back home. They'll spend more than 250 million hours looking for a safe place to defecate. I mean, every so, woman worldwide? I mean, so what is, a, what is that So that's a summation, number? 200 million yeah. hours just today. For women, so, okay. For water and sanitation. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the, the, there's, you know, there's it's such an overwhelming problem. And uh, the, the thing that we see in it, though, is the reason to believe it can be solved. And I think there's, there's really three core aspects to this. One is that in the last two decades, more than two billion people have come out of extreme poverty. One of the first things particularly women want when they come out of poverty is to secure better water and sanitation services for themselves because they know that's going to link to so much more for their families. The, the second thing is that the coping costs that are involved with this, so the time spent by women collecting water in terms of their health and their cash. A lot of people pay water vendors a huge, sometimes 25% of their income in order to get their water each day. So you have between two and 
300 billion dollars in these coping costs that are tied up by women trying to secure water. And the third thing is there's never been a greater concentration of wealth in the world. And to me, there's also never been a greater concentration of willingness to deploy that wealth to attack these big social problems. So I think if you look at, at all those three factors, we can absolutely solve this crisis and do it in our lifetime. But when you say deploy wealth, how, how do you do that? I mean, to solve the water crisis? Yeah. Well, I, in fact, I just had the good fortune of speaking at the Giving Pledge recently. And so the Giving Pledge are people who are, are billionaires and, and above who have pledged to give away half of their wealth in their lifetime or upon right. death to tackle these big social issues. And I was very pleased to be invited in because this group is seeing water and sanitation as mm -hmm. something very important to, right. to bring. But also, not just philanthropy, but the investment capital. And I think what we see with our social impact investing fund with water equity, we can leverage this capital. And we've already brought more than a billion dollars of private capital into the market to fund water and sanitation loans for poor women. And that's a billion dollars in philanthropy that we didn't have to raise mm -hmm. because we're leveraging in the capital markets. Mm -hmm. So access, yeah, access to the financial systems uh, to, is, is something Vodafone is trying to do because you're, you have one of the really practical means, you have phones, you know? That, that makes a whole lot of difference in, in developing countries. Can you tell us a little bit about the endeavors you, you brought about? Well, I, as you say, uh, more people have access to mobile phones in the emerging markets than they do to clean water and, um, or electricity. So I think you know, it is the responsibility of our industry to think about how we can really bridge the gap by using mobile technologies and giving access to people. And it always starts with, the, with really understanding the need and the gaps. In the, in the case of financial inclusion, we are aware that you know, there are two billion unbanked people and, uh, and that they have, to re they have to go through very conventional methods to make transfers, which are usually not safe and they can also be very expensive. And women are also more disadvantaged uh, because they don't have, a, they're, they're, they're less in, into the system. And uh, with that insight, we have uh, launched, um, in, in, in starting with Kenya, our products, uh, which is M-Pesa, which is a mobile payment service. And today, M-Pesa is um, uh, enabling 35 million uh, people in Africa uh, to, to make uh, safe, secure uh, money transfers and do business through mobile phones. And just in Kenya, M-Pesa has lifted uh, the 2% the, uh, of the population above the poverty line already. And we see that in some neighborhoods where uh, the concentration is even, even higher than that, uh, we, we see even more uh, increased numbers, especially among, among the women. So, uh, and, and we have been also expanding the service of M-Pesa now to, to, uh, to include insurance, to make more savings, loans, and, uh, and uh, what I'm also very uh, uh, you know, excited about is that M-Pesa is even saving lives today. In Tanzania, we're using M-Pesa as a payment to reach out to pregnant women who are uh, at risk with their babies, and, uh, and they're able to, we're able to send them money so that they can get into our network of ambulance taxis that we have engaged with, and uh, so that they can, they can be transported to the hospital on time, saving lives. So these are just examples of how mobile technology um, complemented with the right apps and uh, if they can reach, if we can make them more accessible to the people, and it can also be used for social good. So, Sue, uh, I, I'm sure you have seen that kind of uh, apps <laughs> in your life. I know that you've been very engaged uh, in the different times of your life, but in India too, and uh, that uh, helping people access to the financial system is something you find very important. Uh, it's not necessarily the main focus of what the Gates Foundation does, but it's, maybe you could talk about it too, because how, how do we bring those people in? Well, uh, we're also very positive about uh, uh, the work you just heard about, about financial inclusion. It turns out if you, if you have money in the hands of women, they'll spend it on their families. 
They'll spend it on their family's health and their family's education. So that kind of financial inclusion uh, drives the future for entire families, um, boys and girls. Um, but, but you were asking about investment, and I want to talk for a couple minutes about how we use our strategic investment fund at Gates Foundation. Um, we know that, uh, and we work with many, many NGOs, not-for-profits, the academic sector, governments, but we also work with the private sector. And it's typical that when I talk to someone in the private sector, they direct me to the corporate social responsibility um, part of their company, and I say, no, I, I want to talk to your business leaders. Uh, I, I want to talk to your CFO, I want to talk to your CEO. Um, these are your future customers we're talking about. And the reason we work with um, private industry is we want to tap into that pace and that passion and, and that capital uh, that, that those private industries put to work. So um, maybe a couple examples specifically for women that I'm really excited about. So we use our strategic investment fund for something uh, called volume guarantees. And we use that when we believe that if a company or companies can meet a target product profile, if they can hit a certain price and offering, that they will sell into some of the poorest markets in the world. So we did this with Bayer and Merck for uh, um, contraception, for modern injectable contraceptives that we were confident women would use. And the estimate is that 42 million women have received injectable contraceptives based on that investment, that volume guarantee. And in fact, it's been so successful that the company said, we don't need your capital. We now believe that there's a market that women will drive because women want to decide when they have their children, how they want to space their children, and how many they want to have. The thing is that you mm -hmm. helped setting the right price for the women, right? For, with the volumes, if you're out, how do they keep the right price? So the, the right price is part of the contract. It comes with the investment. Uh, another example of the right price is uh, an investment that we made with Pfizer, who make a, a product called Cyanopress, a self-injected contraceptive, so that if there's any stigma or concern the woman has about others seeing her getting family planning, she can self-administer, something we think is very important. The volume guarantee there, the, the arrangement, allows for an 85 cent price for this long-acting self-injected contraceptive. And that means that women in 69 of the world's poorest countries will have access to this contraceptive that otherwise would never have been affordable for those women. When you say you're talking to the CEOs and CFOs in the companies, does it mean that you try to bring their money in your fund too? It's not only the Gates Foundation money? So in our strategic investment fund, it's only Gates Foundation. Okay. Mm -hmm. The encouragement we'd like them to think about is that if you look for your future customers, if you look at the parts of the world that are growing, Sub-Saharan Africa is growing. Mm -hmm. And in fact, it's both promising and concerning. By 2050, we think that there'll be as many as 2.5 billion people in Sub-Saharan Africa. And the, the promise is, if you're a company, that's where your future customers are. That's where growth is. That's more than double the estimate for the US and Europe combined. So one of the questions we ask is, what will be the opportunity for those many millions and billions of people? And so that a lot of our investments are not just access and affordability for the products I talked about, but for the health and education of, of those individuals in Sub-Saharan Africa. It could be the next wave of people who lift themselves out of poverty, and it must be. And it must be, absolutely. So, Mary, you've seen that the private sector is very much involved, and it's been for some years now. Uh, big philanthropy people wanted to, uh, to um, uh, 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 I don't know how to say it, to adopt the private enterprise uh, mo uh, uh, mojo, probably, to, to philanthropy. And there always has been a little criticized about states being, you know, having a lot of inertia, not being that... Uh, uh, not helping solve the problems. But there are some areas where it seems that it's impossible to do without the state. And one is uh, that you're very keen on, it's, it's climate change. And uh, can you talk a little bit about that because you feel you have a feeling of urgency that is really striking. Well, first of all, it is impressive uh, to hear examples of what can be done uh, with uh, innovation technology, the private sector. 
but of course, that's complementary to the main responsibility. And the main responsibility for the Sustainable Development Goals rests with those governments who adopted the 2030 Agenda. 193 countries negotiated and adopted. And the language of the 2030 Agenda is full of human rights, because these are human rights. Rights to water, to health, to food, to education. And therefore, there is a responsibility on governments to implement. And the truth is, sadly, there are governments that are not meeting that responsibility. And even the multilateral system, as you indicated, is not in a good place. Uh, it's a bit bumpy. And we are about to mark next month the 70th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, adopted here in Paris um, in 1948. Um, what I'm concerned about, and I want to really emphasize this, is that when we're talking about the sustainable development goals now, we know what we mean by sustainability. And it is very uh, acute, if I could put it that way, because it means the world has to stay at 1.5 degrees Celsius. Um, anything above that, we're in, into a danger zone. Now, I remember very well, uh, because I was the special envoy of the Secretary General on climate change at the time, the lead up to Paris, and a mantra of the small island states and the poorest, least developed countries. And the mantra was 1.5 to stay alive. 1.5 to stay alive, meaning if we go above 1.5, islands will go underwater and very poor countries will be even more buffeted by something they're not responsible for, the injustice of climate change. And so we got the 1.5 in the text. And then Paris asked the scientists, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, um, you know, many, many scientists from around the world, tell us what this means, because we've never understood before. What exactly does it mean to stay at 1.5, and what's the difference between 1.5 and 2 degrees? And in many ways, that's a revelation, because what the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has told us quite starkly is 1.5 degrees is not just for small island states and least developed. It's the only livable, safe and not as good as now because we'll have more emissions and it'll be, we'll have more hurricanes, we'll have more storms, more drought, more fires, but it'll be better, it'll be livable. After that, when you go between 1.5 and 2 degrees, things happen that are irreversible. We lose the coral reefs, we lose the Arctic ice, the permafrost begins to melt, and therefore we're getting into loopback territory and scientists don't understand what that may mean. So, when we talk about the Sustainable Development Goals, we have to understand that we have to combine that with reducing greenhouse gas emissions by 45% by 2030. And that's less than 12 years away. So I am very keen to see the political um, answer to that. And I'm not seeing it yet. Even at the Paris Peace Forum, there was not that sense that governments understand that we have to have a safe world for our children and grandchildren. And I think it's women worldwide and women's organizations and conferences like this that have to start really putting pressure on. I mean, are we understanding that we are not on course for a safe world for our children and grandchildren? That must have huge meaning, particularly for women and women leaders. And you know, I really appeal to women worldwide to get very angry about this and young people even more young men and women, to get really angry about what is happening in our world, where we've got to through lack of attention and lack of political will, and to get, you know, get really focused on the steps that need to be taken, which are not business as usual, not even philanthropy as usual, much, much more intensive, mm -hmm. particularly on the political government side. And we, we know here in France how hard it is. <laughs> Great show of support here. I just want to tell you, uh, in France, we're trying to change from diesel to normal yeah. uh, oil, and it's really, we're going to have thousands of yellow people <laughs> very angry tomorrow uh, all around France because but that it's better, kind it's of better, change is it's very better, hard. It's better to take those hard decisions now because they can be taken than wait, and then it will be too late, and the decisions will be harder but not harder to take. Right, Gary? Well, yeah, I, I love this theme of building bridges. And just to bridge a little bit between, between climate change and the, uh, the private sector and investment capital, the, the people that are 
already being affected the most by climate change are the most vulnerable, and they're the ones who have the least responsibility in creating the situation. And we see this all the time in our work because, you know, when you think of climate change, one of the first things you think about is water. You know, not enough in some places, too much in other places. And so we see those people who've just kind of joined, you know, the family of people who have water, who just got these resources, and now they're, they're being threatened because of groundwater depletion, saltwater intrusion. So that, that whole concept of climate change change and trying to help also with, uh, you know, the adaptation of populations who are going to be affected regardless of, of the increase in temperature. And so we work a lot with the public sector because one of the things that's happening there uh, is the failure to get some of the poorest access to these services. And so what we do is we help people get connected to the utilities who otherwise would, they would be shut out from that because they can't afford to pay that connection fee. And this goes back to the capital issue because with our water credit initiative, we actually have, have worked with more than 100 microfinance institutions to get loans into the hands of women so that they can get these, these resources. And I'll just give one real life example of how this works. I was in the Philippines recently in one of the slums and met with a woman there called Lina Riza, was her name. She was paying $60 every month to these water vendors who would come around and sell water in her slums. And she had to do that because she couldn't afford the connection fee to the utility. So she got a water credit loan. She has payments of about $5 a month on that loan for about two years. And now her water tariff to the utility is only $4.50. So right there, between $10 a month now versus 50 or 60 before, uh, she's putting that money in her pocket, using that to improve the, the lives of her family. And so what we've done is create this on-ramp for capital to come in. Now we have these investment funds uh, that we, we've raised. We just closed our second fund at $48 million uh, uh, this week. And those funds then find their way into these microloans so that more people like her can get water and sanitation. And then investors can actually get a financial return. Some investors like uh, Bank of America, IKEA Foundation, Hilton, and others are investing in this. So that private capital is available to solve some of these most intractable problems. And I know with climate change, we can make the same thing happen. You know, I, I want to also make a point that one of the things that I think we all underestimate is the impact of climate change on farmers. Mm. And so a lack of water is one outcome. Hunger um, and the real threat on food security mm. is another. So in addition to financial inclusion, um, the other two areas of, of gender that we focus on is self-help groups and assisting women smallholder farmers, who are most of farmers in sub-Saharan Africa, um, to, to adapt to climate change. Uh, in Malawi, I met a smallholder farmer, Patricia, who was so inspiring to me because when, when she had access to seeds, when she had access to farming methods through a self-help group that could help her learn how to adapt mm -hmm. to soil changes and climate change, not only was she able to grow crops, make the money, send her kids to school and have a healthier family, but she also acquired more land and became a small businesswoman. Mm -hmm. And so what I learned from Patricia was that that, that partnership among women that you see in, in the self-help groups, that ability to learn how to use seeds, capital, and get the most productivity out of your land is not only important now, but with climate change, it will be essential for the no. future of farmers like Patricia. Can I yes. just uh, build sure. on that? Um, we are also very conscious uh, that our technology can help um, enhance the productivity in agriculture because if the, fa the small farmers, if they can have the right information relevant to them real time uh, about basic things like weather too, uh, how to feed the animal, when to vaccinate, etc., uh, we know that the productivity can in increase immensely and this is why we have launched uh, an initiative called Farmers Club in sub-Saharan Africa as well as India and where basically uh, we are providing uh, these farmers a uh, special app where it is tailored to their profession area uh, and then really sending them uh, information uh, through their mobile phones 
but also we have partnered with the uh, Minister of Agriculture in several of the markets so that they can also provide the right information about the incentive schemes and the, 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 uh, the best practices of farming to the farmers. So I think this is a good example of you know, seeing an issue and partnering with different parts of the uh, ecosystem to really um, tap into the right uh, opportunity for, um, for, for the society. Could so I just make um, sure. two brief points in response to <clears throat> what we've been hearing? Um, first of all, the importance of stories. Um, I really recognize this now. In fact, I've just written a book called Climate Justice, Hope, Resilience, and the Fight for a Sustainable Future. Eleven stories, nine of them involve women, and that's not accidental, but they're also stories that illustrate the various ways in which people are in very poor countries, or maybe the head of state of Kiribati is, 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 went to Copenhagen, had to go back and tell his people they had no future, something as, a, as president of Ireland I never had to do, and also um, a woman in Australia who formed the One Million Women Project um, to um, become more energy efficient in her own home and you know, link now with developing country women. These are the important ways of getting the message across. But the other point that I've been really aware of, because I was in the California conference recently on climate, and I'm meeting more and more business people and investment and philanthropy who really understand and have the same sense of urgency that I have. I'm not seeing that enough at the political level. And the reason, I think, is the short-term cycle of elections. Politicians are looking to two years, three years, five years at most, and they need to look at future generations, and they need to take that decision. Yeah. And also we have bad examples, because when everybody agrees at COP21, then the, you have the United States pulling yeah. back from the agreement, which is, you know... And slippage, terrible. generally. Yep. Yeah, terrible. Uh, I don't know, it makes me think of an anecdote. I was once on a panel with the CARE organization, and women from Africa were telling about their experiences, and they were saying how much it was important for them to keep the money and not give it to the men. I don't want to be sexist with men, but what they were saying is that if I give him the money, he's going to buy a motorbike or a new woman. So I have to keep it. And as you were saying, they're really the one holding the family and building, uh, and building for education. So I was wondering, in, in what you're doing, all of you, I know, Mary, definitely what you want is awareness. You want to shout out, you know, you, you mm. need public audience. Yeah, uh, the, the, the elders, I'm chair now with the yes. elders, as you said. The elders have, have this now as our top priority, that and nuclear disarmament. They're the two top priorities of the elders. And we will try to message the urgency of climate change and the, the fact that to be sustainable, we now have to work for this very acute um, 12 years, 11 plus years, um, to get a 45% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. Politically, that's still not the language we're hearing, but we have to hear it. And I was wondering, in, in your organization, are there things that could be improved that would help you? Is it, is it new legislation? Is it different ways of financing? Is there, what, what could help you be more effective in what you're trying to do uh, on the field? Gary, maybe? Well, I think one thing is just a mindset. And, and I think what I hear across the panel is that uh, as we look at the private sector and the public sector and bridging, is to, the mindset needs to be changed from like the people living in poverty as a problem for us to solve, mm -hmm. rather see them as a market to be served. And I think when we look uh, at this, we see the potential of women to lift themselves up out of poverty if they're given like the right, right financial tools. Uh, you know, the, the water credit initiative that we've done, women repay these loans at 99%. Right? right, 16 million people have gotten access to water and toilets by getting a loan versus waiting on charity. Mm -hmm. And there's always gonna be those who are in the most extreme of poverty that do need that, that hand up in terms of, of a, a subsidy, but we need to reframe the issue and look at how do we drive capital from the top down in order to, to bridge this gap. And I think that's what I would, I would say. And Sue, I was wondering, I mean, the Gates Foundation is something very special. Uh, and it, it tried to put a lot of leverage in its actions. Do you think there should be more of them? Is it something you would like to see happening? 
or, or something different? Well, your, your question about what I'd like to see to, 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 to put more power behind right. the things that we care about, more women. More women? More women. <laughs> uh, so this is a good, good audience for that. Yes. <laughs> more women yeah. and more women, more women in leadership, yes. more women engaged, more women in the countries we work with and the collaborators and the partners we work with to drive change. It's estimated that if women had the same kinds of opportunities for productivity, to be involved, to be engaged, that men do, we would add $28 trillion to the global economy by 2025. $28 trillion. So it, 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 getting women engaged in ways where they have power mm -hmm. is important, and it's also an inspiration to others. I, I mentioned Patricia in Malawi. Here's the best part of getting to meet her. So the, I, I went to Malawi with Melinda Gates, and there's nothing like being with Melinda Gates, hearing about a woman smallholder farmer and how powerful she was. But we noticed, as we were sitting talking to these women in the self-help group, that there was a group of men kind of spying on us. And, and uh, so Melinda and I said, C come on over. Tell us what you're, wh why you're hovering. And they said, oh, well, after you're finished, we're going to use those mats because now we have a men's self-help group. <laughs> <laughs> we were delighted. And, and uh, uh, Melinda asked uh, the man who was clearly driving this, well, what, what in the world's going on? And, and he said two things that I thought were hilarious. One is he said, you know, I noticed that even though we were a little suspicious of this self-help group, when, when my neighbor's wife went to the self-help group, her children started gaining weight. Their hair was very shiny. She was so great at growing crops that the family started to look really well. So I wanted a piece of that action. And he said, so everyone made fun of me. Everyone was teasing me, a, a self-help group, your wife seems so powerful, aren't you embarrassed? He said, look, I've got more food, we've got more money, we've got some school fees now, aren't you embarrassed? Yeah. <laughs> and I thought the power of the women driving that agenda and seeing how contagious it was, it was just delightful. I'd like to ask you, Serpil, is it true? I mean, you're a COO of Vodafone, so you're in power in your organization. I'm the CEO of Europe. Well, that's good Europe. enough. I mean, uh, <laughs> congratulations for that. Uh, but do you think that being, uh, being at, in that position really helps you put more influx in the things that are important to you in those matters or not? Of course. I think, well, first point is for organizations like us, we are very conscious that our customers and the society is expecting more from us than just you know, doing economic performance. Uh, there's a growing demand in the society that companies, the private sector, needs to really do active work around improving lives and contributing to the societies. Because the relationship of the customer with the brands is, is going beyond just a kind of getting a service. They really expect that corporate responsibility. And therefore, we, I think what we have done in our company is that we want, we, we're putting our purpose of providing a better future for everyone as core to everything we do. So we are de defining our success whereby our social accomplishment is equivalent to the economic accomplishment. And thereby, we believe that we can build a better loyalty, better affinity for our brand, and that's going to be good for us, but also it will be good for society. And you know what? Our employees are more motivated if they see a purpose-led company, and that's what we want to do. And I think, you know, everybody in our executive committee is really convinced that's the, that's the way mm. to do it. We can also help attract talent to your company too for those reasons. Uh, we have five minutes to open to the floor so uh, we have some mics around if anybody wants to uh, ask a question. I think we have time for one or two. Uh, just raise your hand and we'll bring you a mic. Yes. Please, would you bring a mic to this person in red? <laughs> Uh, 
Hello, I'm Anne Ravanona from Global Invest Her president, she's my president, a former <laughs> president of Ireland, so delighted to have you all. My question is how do we get more women into the green economy? So actually creating companies to be part of the wealth creation and to help solve the key issue of the SDG for climate change. So how do we get more women into green mm. and to share more wealth among women? Yeah. I think that's an important point, and I think everybody probably on this panel would like to see more women not only in business, but leading businesses at the top of, um, like Vodafone and, and, and others, uh, because it does make a difference. Uh, the priorities change. Um, there's a cultural um, sense when you have a woman um, who, who has that kind of um, power to uh, make, make, make a difference. Also, you know, women um, change behavior in families, but also in companies. And um, I think, you know, what we need is uh, to see more women at every level. Um, we need more politically, including in Ireland. Um, uh, I, I'm very pleased with a country in Africa at the moment, Ethiopia. Half the cabinet in Ethiopia are women, um, and there's now a woman president in Ethiopia and a woman chief justice. And all of this matters because it will be an example in the Horn of Africa, an example, and, uh, you know, and, uh, and that's, you know, what we need pressure for. And I also hope that you know, business leaders who are showing an urgency and ambition about climate change will influence more politicians. You know, we need the bridging um, straight from the business sector that's, if you, if you like, non-fossil fuel or very few fossil fuel companies are moving enough in the right direction. But um, you know, I, I am very impressed with um, what I'm hearing from, and I'm, I'm part of the B team as an elder and the B team is giving even more leadership, and it made a commitment um, in January 2015, um, so 11 months before the Paris Agreement, to be net zero greenhouse gas emissions in their companies and in their supply chain. Now, the whole of We Mean Business, about 400 leading companies, is considering making that commitment, actively considering, and that's making a big difference. If only governments would, Spain has committed now recently to be net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050, and then you work backwards to what, what steps you need to take. Mm. The European Union needs to do that. We need to see this as being kind of a, a stake in the ground for the future, if you like, and um, that means we can reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 45% um, by um, 2030, and that means that hopefully those who have diesel cars that were persuaded by their government. That happened in Ireland as well. Governments persuaded ordinary people to get into diesel cars and they would be cheaper to run right. and better for them. I think governments need to incentivize getting out and incentivize getting into electric cars as quickly as possible. Exactly. Can I just build, make one build on that? I think there's another aspect I think which is going to be very important, a lever important for climate. Um, change is if we can really exploit the future technologies that are coming up, the digital technologies, uh, uh, there is going to be a huge efficiency in the way the businesses, the companies, the manufacturing can be done if we can really seize the full opportunity of the, uh, the new technologies such as uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, uh, and combined with uh, ultra-fast broadband networks uh, can be a big positive lever to offset our, our, our uh, carbon footprint and, uh, and make, do business smarter. I think uh, we're getting at the end of the panel, so I have to ask you one question, and you're supposed to answer each. What would be, what would be the one action that your organization could take that would have the biggest impact? We're going to start with you, Gary. That our organization could take? Or? Yes, okay. I, I think the biggest action would be to, uh, to look to invest. In, in this sector, and I think it can happen from accredited investors who can bring in millions, and we're doing that with lots of different uh, foundations and corporations and financial institutions. So those of those of you in the room who have that access and can make that happen uh, with social impact investing would be great. Uh, next year we'll be launching a, a more democratized platform around that, so we're looking at different ways that people might be able to use their savings while it's parked in their savings account, and we can tap into that to go deploy these loans to, to poor women. So we want to figure out ways that everybody can, can get engaged to make a difference. Mary? I had already said what the priority of the elders is, and we will be messaging very strongly 
on the urgency of addressing climate. So maybe I'll just raise one issue that hasn't come up in our conversation. It's really important to move rapidly um, to renewable energy. It mustn't be on the backs of workers. Um, so we need what's called just transition. And um, Spain is a good example of this now. Spain wants to get out of coal within the next year. And it has put up 200 million to fund this, to fund pensions and training and retraining and put new energy into the areas that had coal. Um, um, there's going to be a new, uh, another conference in Poland, in Katowice, um, next month. Yeah, and um, there is going to be, I hope, a declaration on just transition. And I would like some of the business leaders to hear this message. That's going to need huge investment. And unless we get the investment in just transition, we won't be able to move as rapidly as we need to out of the coal, oil, gas into renewable energy. So it's a, it's a, it's a new area of massive funding in order that workers and their families see the future as being their future too. Massive lobbyist here, I must say. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, Sue, for you. So the, the, the world will not achieve the audacious SDG goals if we do business as usual. Mm. The, the single most important thing that I would, uh, I would add to this conversation is we need more innovation. We need, we need to think about doing things fundamentally different. And, and I'm inspired by tapping into sources of innovation that from people who we haven't always thought of. So for us, diversity, equity, and inclusion means look to women, look to young people, look to people of color, and look to people from very different geographies mm -hmm. to contribute that innovation. I think youth is really a part of the answer to your question too, because they're very motivated by you know, the green economy, and uh, that's probably a good reservoir of, of force here. Finally, I'm when, when, when I look at the future of our industry, I see so exciting technologies coming up, which is going to really accelerate uh, the human being if we really use it for the good of the, of the uh, societal progress and humanity. Uh, what I really look forward to is that everybody has access to these technologies. Uh, everybody has access to ultra-fast broadband. And... Uh, but we cannot do it alone as an industry. We need the governments to support us and not really see us as only a, as a way of taxation, but really help in a, in a way that the sector can sustainably invest uh, for the future and provide access to everyone so that nobody is left behind. Well, thank you very much, all of you. It brings a lot of awareness and a lot of confidence, too. Thank you very much.